Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It's a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you this hour is another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off. We have a packed episode, a completely and totally packed episode. We have not one but two guests this hour on the Ask Noah Show. Steve Evans from Red Hat joins us to talk to us about what it takes to get hired by Red Hat. I'll bet you in the year and odd change of months that we've been doing this show, the question, the, the one repetitive question that I get every time I meet somebody in person doesn't necessarily come up on the air a whole lot, doesn't necessarily come up uh, in emails or anything like that. But I, when I meet people, when I sit down with them, one of the things they want to know is they say, Noah, you've been to all of these open source places. You've been involved with at a deep level with all these open source companies. What do they look for and how do we get a job with them? And Steve not only has an interesting and exciting story about getting a job at Red Hat, but Steve's job in and of itself is super interesting. And what he does for Red Hat is super interesting. Now, I have said that I've said it here on the air. I have said it to Steve directly, and I'll continue to say it until I don't think it's true anymore. And that is that the one thing I can't stand about Red Hat is I don't think they do a good enough job about telling the rest of the world all of the very cool things that they do. And uh, as I brought some of those concerns up to Steve and, and to other people uh, at Red Hat, they said, you know what? We agree. We, we want to tell that story. And we think that the Ask Noah Show and the Ask Noah Show audience is the place for us to do that. So joining us for the second time this month remotely is Mr. Steve Ovens. Hey, Steve, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time to be here. So um, before I want to get into your career at Red Hat, I want to get into all of the things that got you hired at Red Hat. But before we get to any of that, I want to start out and I want to talk to you and pick your brain a little bit about some breaking news that that we've been following here at the Ask Nova Show, which is um, the, Steam Compa- the Steam Compatibility Play Report. And by the way, if you are listening to the program live and you'd like to join the conversation, we'd invite you to do so at 1-855-450-NOTES, 855-450-6624. We'll leave the phone lines open throughout the duration of our interview with Steve um, because, as always, your calls go to the front of the line. But Steve, tell me if you if you would, I know you've been following this pretty closely too. Tell me what why is everybody so excited about Steam this week? Yeah, so it started off there were some unconfirmed rumors as normally happens with Valve. People were watching commits go by and there were some comments in a commit that indicated that they were working on some sort of compatibility toggle. And it turned out that for the last two years or so, they've actually been working in conjunction with Code Weavers to produce a fork from Wine. I, I'm not sure if fork is exactly the right word, but when I looked into it, Valve's reasoning was that there were some things that they wanted to do inside of the Wine branch that Wine wasn't taking because they didn't feel that it was suitable for the direction they were trying to take Wine as a whole. So they worked in conjunction with Code Weavers to produce something called Proton. And Proton has a lot of enhancements, especially when it comes to games that need multi-threading or that benefit from multi-threading. So what they've basically enabled you to do, if you enable the beta inside of the Steam client, that gives you a new option inside the settings where you can go and say, um, allow compatibility mode in Steam. And then it also has a separate drop down to say, well, I want to use the default or I want to use the beta version of Proton. When you turn that on, you'll have to restart the client and it'll prompt you to do that. When when that happens, your entire list, if you have Windows or you have Linux games, will now show up as a way to be installed. Cool. Now, Steam, Valve has 27 games, I believe, that are officially whitelisted. That's their terminology to say, we officially support this and we've QA'd them all. But the community has kind of rallied behind this. Um, and I've been actively involved. I've submitted uh, six issues on Proton's tracker, 
And there's also a spreadsheet, which I believe Noah will have linked in the show notes, where yes. at current, there's about 2,400 games that the community has rated, and about 1,800 of them are rated as stable or completely stable. Um, and that ratio kind of m matches what my experience has been. So I have about 300 games in my Steam library, and I've gone through, I would say, about 100 of them and only 17 so far haven't worked. And some of that may be fixed in the future because DirectX 10 is currently not supported in this. So they're supporting nine and they're supporting 11. But the games that have DirectX 10 only, they're, they either crash or they don't work properly. So everybody seems to be really excited about this because it, it means that all of your old titles for people like me who have abandoned Windows some time ago now I have a raft of games that I can play again. Right, yeah, they're coming back. And as the chat room points out, you know, I, we've been following this this news. The, the news that Steam was doing stuff broke earlier in the day because I was kind of dipping into it. But I guess a lot of this has just transpired within the last 20 minutes or so. So it, the mainstream got a hold of this. I, I kind of dug around when I heard rumors of it. So I started working on this on Friday. And Obviously, I'm not the only one. There, are, There's tons of people. But when I started digging around, there was about 100 issues on Proton. Uh, when I checked later, earlier today, it was about 570 open issues. So, wow. like, Valve is just getting um, people volunteering hand over fist. You interested in taking a phone call, Steve? Sure. Cool. Let's go to the phones. one 450 no It's 855-450-6624. You can email the show live at ask noahshow.com chaz calls from new york hey chaz welcome to the ask noah show hey noah hey steve how's it going we're doing pretty good doing excellent sir how can we help well uh kind of uh piggybacking off of what you guys were talking about and also what uh, we were talking about last week noah um you correctly predicted that proton would be in some way shape or form based on wine which uh means that i would like the five uh, numbers that you think the New York lottery is going to do. But I wanted to talk about some of the larger implications of that. I kind of picked, uh, picked up midway through you guys' conversation. I heard that uh, it's almost a bit of a fork of wine realistically, but here's what I'm wondering. Right now, if you use Steam under Windows, you can add non-Steam games to your Steam library. Uh, I've got Origin games that I, lost, that I launched via Steam. I've got... Uh, the first two Halo games back when they were still making Halo for PC. I've got a game that I uh, got out of a cereal box in the 90s because uh, that was a promotion that Chex did for a while. But uh, what I'm kind of getting at is, does the fact that this wine implementation um, is being implemented now kind of potentially give the ability to play non-Steam games on Steam OS? since, you know, obviously it installs on Windows the same way, and Wine right. is a way of playing Windows software. And then uh, the other part it kind of uh, piggybacks off of what you just said, Noah. You said that uh, the Valve was getting a lot of interest in doing this. How much of a signal do you think that is to uh, Valve that the gaming community wants off of Windows? Sure. Steve, I'll let you go first. So... On the idea of, like, can I play non-Steam games with this compatibility, the answer is yes. Steam, ha Valve has provided, like, instructions on how to build Proton yourself. It's up in their Git, Git repository, and some people are actually running Proton from the command line the way you would run Wine. There's a, currently at least two open issues that I'm aware of asking for them to put this in the the steam client so that it's an option because right now the only option you can you have is for the versions of proton that are officially supported you can select a drop down and tell it which version that you want to use inside of steam so what one of the asks was is expose the same mechanism but allow us to to actually select something on our system for example uh, there are some games where wine, like the vanilla wine, works better than Proton, so they want that option. And then there's another uh, request for exactly what you're asking for, being able to add a game into Steam and use Proton to launch it. 
And uh, to piggyback off of what Steve is saying, uh, yes, I do. I, I do definitely think this changes the landscape drastically. I think the motivation here is Valve Steam. Valve wants Steam to become the de facto game platform and place to distribute games and play games and all of that. And I think as part of that, they want a cohesive infrastructure, a cohesive operating system that they can base all of those games on. And they don't want that necessarily to be tied to Microsoft. They don't want that to be tied to whatever whim uh, Microsoft decides decides to go. And they've also found that on a pure technical level, when you take the religion out of it, when you take the emotion out of it, when you take the market out of it, on a pure technical level, Linux, uh, Linux every single time when stacked back to back will outperform a Windows box. Just the way that the efficiency of the way the code is written, the efficiency of the way the system is designed, you're going to get a better performance on Linux than you would on a on a competitive or the, on a comparable Windows box. And so if you're the game manufacturer and you can get away from some of the market hurdles and say, all right, I understand that nobody, it's a chicken or the egg thing. You guys don't want to game on Linux because nobody has ported their games and you guys don't want to port your games because nobody has, you know, because nobody uh, is there to play on it. Let's bridge that gap for, for a little bit because in the end we all win. And at the end, that's what we need to make our platform successful and stable and have a lot of longevity left in the thing. And um, I don't think they're going to see a lot of resistance from Microsoft because I think Microsoft interest in the gaming platform is on the Xbox console. I don't think they really care about PC gamers. So all that to say, I think that there are a number of different forces working from all sides of the equation to, to, to push this forward. And I think this is just the first. I don't think this is the last of it. I think this is the first step of what we're going to see is a continual transition towards Linux gaming. I think Valve cool. also wants now, to piggyback on us? some of the uh, the goodwill of the community. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but they recognize the value of getting a bunch of eyes on something and, and fixing it. You know, a lot of us are more uh, technically inclined, right? And yeah, we're going to look and say, give me the debug log and I will tell you what the problem is and how I fixed it. And on top of that, um, they've shown by their injection into the kernel, like, kicking stuff upstream into the kernel for, say, the Steam controller, that they realize the value of committing things upstream, and they don't have to carry this burden by themselves. Right, absolutely. Chess, uh, you were going to jump in there? Yeah, I was just uh, wondering, do you think this means we see a resurgence in uh, Valve encouraging companies to build their own Steam machines and uh, subsequently sell them, or do you think it's going to be uh, more along the lines of just Here's our operating system. Go ahead and install it or build a PC on your own and, you know, whatever happens, happens. Yeah, I don't think Steam has an interest in SteamOS without the Steam box, right? I, I, because at the end of the day, as long I can say all I want to about the longevity of Windows and the longevity of Steam and the longevity of gaming on Windows and all that. Um, but at the end of the day, today, the world we live in today... In August of 2018, Microsoft Win still makes Microsoft Windows 10, and Steve still runs on Windows 10. So today, that's not a problem. And I don't think Valve would be bending over backwards. And I think, you know, essentially forking, forking the Wine infrastructure and, and working with a company as large as Code Weavers to create this system... I think that is definitely bending over backwards to get Windows games to run on Linux. So there's no real benefit in that to them today unless unless they're interested in eventually pushing hardware boxes. And if you think about it, it, it it's it's a it's really it's a three part rub for for Valve. It's a three part win because they win in the aspect that everybody wants to publish their game to Steam and you can bet that Steam is making money off of that off of those transactions. They win in the fact that they are going to be able to compete in the PC market space, the console market space and eventually i think they're going to move into the android market space i think they'd like to be in the mobile gaming space i think that as you see them build this infrastructure out and i think as you see them make some of these decisions i think all of those lead to a a, a, a very long picture of really thirty thousand foot view as it were of this of this landscape and saying all right what do we need to do? What decisions can we be making today to make sure that we are the most dominant, relevant gaming platform 10 years from now? And I think what they have latched on to correctly, I might add, is that when you can when you can tag on to this aspect of community, 
uh, everybody wants to pitch in. Steve, you yourself have contributed to this uh, repository for Valve. Yeah, it's just minor things, right? Like I, I made a couple suggestions saying like here, these things should be whitelisted and this is why. And I had these problems. This is how I fixed it. And like just very minor things. I haven't done any code, but, you know, uh, I do what I can in my free time. Absolutely, but uh, you know, downplay the you know the individual contribution. But the 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 my I guess my point was that they are getting they're going to get people that are going to willingly give of their time uh, for free to make this reality happen, and 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 in doing so, they're going to foster this this uh, this community, and that is as we've seen with companies like Apple, that kind of marketing is very very powerful. There are a lot of people that will go buy the latest iPhone not because it's a technically superior product, but because they just want to be known as the guy who has the latest iPhone because the Apple has built a culture around these products. Uh, products right and and you see that and we see that in the linux sphere as well you'll go to these linux fest and stuff I've, I've said numerous times one of the best things about going to places like southeast linux fest it's not necessarily that i mean they do have fantastic speakers and they do have great food and there is you know wonderful networking opportunities and stuff but the real value there is that people get passionate and excited to be around other enthusiasts and i think that's the kind of community that th these kind of decisions that valve is making is fostering Anyway, uh, thank you so much, Chaz, for the phone. I, I appreciate it. We went a little bit longer with that than I, than I ordinarily would, but I do appreciate uh, you taking the time to call. And Steve, thanks a lot for breaking that down and, and working with us on that. Again, as Steve said, there is a, uh, it's a Google Sheets document. It's the Steam Play Compatibility Report. We'll have that linked in the show notes. You can get the show notes, of course, by going to podcast.asknoahshow.com and uh, click on the latest episode, um, and, uh, and we'll have that linked for you there. Steve Ovens. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us. Um, I appreciate you talking to us a little bit about the Valve issue, the Steam issue. Of course, that's not really what you, we brought you here for. The real the reason that you're here is because we get asked time and time and time again, how do I get hired by companies like Red Hat? How do I get hired? How do I get paid to do the thing that I love to do, which is work in the open source community? Now, before I get to any of that, I, I, I got to ask you a couple basic questions. The first of which being, how did you get started on Linux? What was the first time that you realized there was this cool and exciting, albeit alternative operating system? So that's kind of an interesting question. My dad had always had a computer. He worked for one of the big five banks here in Canada, and he brought home a computer with, you know, we had dial up when there was only BBSs kind of kicking around. So I'd always had computers kicking around in my house, although we weren't allowed to touch them because they were crazy expensive. Um, he had this thing called Mandrake at one point, and I was like, oh, well, how do I run things? And he's like, you don't. That's not that. And I was like, oh, well, I didn't even think anything of it. Um, I grew up in a small town, and by small town, I mean I grew up in like a suburb of a small town, like 2,000 people, and my little area had like 30 people in it. Uh, so... We didn't. We weren't really the bastion of technology, um, so I really didn't hear about Linux before I went to university. I, I when I moved into the dorms, my next door neighbor, he had a next door neighbor, and that guy had Linux on his machine. And so I met this guy. His name was AJ. I met AJ through my friend Bob, and AJ had this whole automated system where every morning he would have something print out. He had some sort of Perl script that would talk to the university website and print out his schedule for the day. And it was like all really neat, like stuff that at the time most people didn't know how to do in Windows. Uh, so Bob, my next door neighbor, was really interested in that. He's like, I want to I want to do this thing. I want to tinker with it. So he and I went garbage uh, we went dumpster diving and we found a computer that had no hard drive and no CD-ROM, but it had a floppy drive. And so he made it work with a floppy drive. And that kind of piqued my interest in like, how is a computer like, so I had seen computers that, you know, you needed to stick in the five and a quarter floppy inch drive just to be able to boot the machine. But I mean, now it's 10 or 12 years past that point, And I'm thinking, how does a modern computer actually have any kind of function with just booting off a floppy drive. So he he did a lot of really interesting network type stuff. I wasn't really interested in that at the time. Um, but he kind of kept at me and 
I'd say a year later, maybe two, he convinced me to install Gentoo, of all things, on one of my computers. Uh, it took four and a half days to compile GNOME, and <laughs> I was crossing my fingers, you know, hoping the power didn't go out. Um, and I kind of tinkered around with this. Um, I actually recently on opensource.com they were asking for people to do submissions for what their first kernel was so part of my story is in there where uh, it took all this time to compile and I got it up and for about a month I was like what do I do with this thing I can't play my games on it and you know I sure I can surf the web but I've never been particularly interested in social media so the thing only lasted about a month um, before I wiped it and I, I put Windows back on. Now this is 2002, so Gen 2 was just past the 1.0 phase, so it was kind of rough. Um, Ubuntu came along after that, and it stuck. I was, I the first version of Ubuntu went on the computer and it stayed on that computer. That computer stayed Ubuntu until like 12.04. Uh, which is amazing. I still have that computer to this day. It sits behind me. It's still running Ubuntu. Uh, it's running 16.04 right now, and it drives my projector. Uh, so fantastic longevity in that machine. Um, so that's really kind of how I got interested in Linux. How I got into a career in Linux is a completely different story. Okay. So I had always been a tinkerer. Uh, I liked to, when it came to computers, I'm not much for tinkering with, you know, security systems or anything like that. But I was that guy that was getting the lead and tracing the contacts on your AMD CPUs so that you could mod it into being a multiprocessor one. And I was doing all kinds of stupid stuff like that. And it was legitimately stupid. I probably could have fried myself several times over because I just like take the fan off and start tinkering around with it while it's on. <laughs> what uh, does this button do? Yep, exactly. Um, I, I grew up with dip switches and, and math pro processors and all of this sort of stuff inside of a computer. Um, so I was never really afraid to tinker around with anything like that. So when I went to university, our university help desk people were, hmm, let's say, lacking. I hope none of them are listening. I'm sorry if you are. Uh, <laughs> So that led to me actually supporting my faculty's computers, uh, particularly when it came to big presentations and stuff like that. And through that, uh, about this time was when I, about halfway through university is when I had switched to using Linux full time. Um, and so one of the, one of my professors looked at me like, you know, this computer thing. So uh, why don't you take care of my database? So I became like a database administrator. Um, <laughs> Very qualified database kind of administrator, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that kind of worked out for me. I, so I did that until the end of university. And when I finished my undergrad, uh, which, by the way, was in political science and history, I had, I had two undergrads, um, this professor said to me, well, if you want a job, I'll, I'll give you a job. I'll pay $30 an hour but you have to take your master's. So she strong-armed me into taking my master's in political science. And one of the things I had to do was, was do the teaching of the first year database class that is required for reasons, I don't know. I don't know why universities choose which courses are mandatory, but I had to take this class that nobody wanted because it was always the first year people and the teachers didn't want to teach it, and the students didn't want to be there because they had to be there. So it was it was an interesting, an interesting transition. So I'm getting all of this experience with um, databases, which I've long since forgotten. But I've been running Linux this entire time, and I see a post from IMAX, the movie studio, saying that they're uh, they're looking for someone, and it was one of those things that I just I knew that if I could get them to talk to me they'd hire me. I don't know why. Maybe it was just, uh, you know, teenage arrogance. Well, I guess in this time, early early 20s arrogance. But I hounded them until I actually got them to talk to me. And they hired me because I threw around terms like CentOS, which at the time, this is like 2005, 
most people hadn't even heard of Linux, let alone CentOS, the Red Hat clone, right? People had heard of Red Hat and Mandrake and right. maybe had heard of Ubuntu at this time. Um, so that's really how I started working with open source and things kind of progressed from there. So um, I worked for IMAX for three years working in the post-production part of it. So we took the, the film, the artists took the films and IMAX was particularly interesting because their entire workflow was Linux. The artists came in, we had three artists, 300 artists that would come in and they'd sit down on the, on these CentOS machines with uh, Wacom tablets and they'd do their thing. And it was me and one other person that would support the entire artist workflow. And I learned how to do bash scripting and I learned about practical networking. Um, I started to touch things like Gluster, although that was like super, super beta. I learned about uh, how to work with scripts. Like I did a lot, a lot of bash scripting and I started to pick up Python during that time. Okay. Um, so that's, that was really the launch into it. And after that, I moved on to a job. So during this time I had a girlfriend and uh, she became my fiance and I'm looking at it and IMAX, while it was steady ish, the post-production is only happening when there's like no movies to be shot. So the job starts when the bad weather hits. So it was a, a winter job sort of thing. I would work from say September through to April or May. And then when the movies are actually being shot, there's obviously nothing for us to do in post-processing. Right. So I was looking for something more steady, just year round, I guess. And I ended up getting a job at a place that had nothing to do with open source. Um, they had, like, they had a couple of SUSE servers, and that's why they hired me. Um, and one of the things that always has stuck with me about that job is the my boss at the time was um, he was Slavic, and he brought me in and he says to me in his very, very Slavic accent, you know why I brought you in? And I said, no, not really. He's like, because you had political science as your schooling and you're applying for a technical job. And he said, you have, and I'm not going to say it because we're on the air. But you no, Steve, I think we... Uh Having a bit of a technical. There we go. You're back now. Sorry about that. So you're having a conversation with your professor, and you said we're not going to say this on the air, but so the guy, this is the boss that's interviewing me. He says, uh, you know, you have political science as your background, and you're applying for a technical job. You really have, uh, I think the Jewish people say chutzpah. <laughs> and okay. He, so yeah, he sure. was. He, he hires me because I apparently had the gall to apply for a technical job when I had no real technical schooling. Um, so I went into this place and found out that they had infrastructure that I don't even know how it was standing. It was kind of standing on one leg. Uh, they had SUSE servers that weren't supported, hadn't been patched. Um, they didn't know how to do database replication. They weren't doing HA anything. And so I came in and I was like, okay, well, what's my budget? And they said, nothing. And I'm like, I'm going to put CentOS on these machines. And so that's what I did. And for them, I actually wrote a fork of Anaconda, which is, for the people that don't know, the Red Hat installer. So my previous job at IMAX, like I said, I'd started to pick up Python, which when I opened up Anaconda, I was like, oh, this is Python. I know how to do this. Um, and the reason why I forked it was because I... At this time, live CDs were almost unheard of, at least for enterprise software. Mm -hmm. So I made it a live CD where it boot into the desktop and there were three icons and you would click on the icon and it would generate you a, um, a kickstart file for the different type of server that you wanted to install and then would go ahead and install it. It would provision it that way. Um, so it was just that sort of thing. So 
that wanting to be a tinkerer, and I'm I'm getting to the red hat part. I know there's probably some people that. No, are this is a great kind of, hype. I just have to tell you because I'm I'm like riveted. <laughs> Usually, I have a trouble struggling letting people talk on my show, and I'm like I'm riveted to the story. So this is great. I am going somewhere. I'll I'll get to the whole how this all ties in. So, anyways, I go in and I do this, and I kind of saw the direction the wind was blowing. When I started, there was me and one other Linux guy, and he was he was quite older. He fancied himself a programmer in Bash. He, and I really mean that. Like he would write three thousand lines of Bash and call it a like, and it was legitimately a program, but like really hard to follow. Bash as once you get to a certain size is just cryptic. Um, but anyways, they decided to let him go and they kept me on because I had made these efficiencies to their infrastructure. So my time was becoming less and less needed. Uh, there was just more and more of my time I was sitting kind of given time to myself because I'd made these efficiencies. I didn't need to care and feed things. So I started doing things like um, I learned how to compile, yes, compile Python for AIX because AIX doesn't have a native Python um, interpreter. And a lot of the clients that we had would not install an AIX, anything. that If it didn't come out of the box, they were not installing it. And so that led me to taking a look at what the database people at this company were doing. And I looked at all the the manual work that they were doing. I'm like, you know, I probably could help you with that. So I would I wrote them an installer. Like I figured out what they normally needed to do and I wrote an installer and they started using that for the people doing the database stuff. And all that was was just basically a, a front end for a gigantic Python script that would do all of the stuff that they needed to do. So I decided that it was time to leave that job. Um, I kept saying to my wife, I don't know how much longer they're going to keep me along because, uh, you know, I'm doing like 20% work sort of thing. And I was feeling bad about it. So I ended up taking another job. And this company did work for the auto industry. So they, they do the, the websites for all of the major auto industry, particularly like if you go to Chrysler, for example, and you want to rotate the car or you want to add new rims and all that sort of stuff, all of those images run through this company's servers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people-wise, not a really big company, but importance-wise, high impact. Right. And uh, I just did the same sort of thing. I wrote uh, a Django web front end for doing deployments because they, we had an issue of like, who was deploying what and when and all that sort of like kind of auditing trail. Um, I picked up a lot more Python at that place. And during this time, I was like, I really wanted to start going to conferences a lot more. I had always been going to Ohio Linux Fest, which by the way, um, plug plug, their, their conference is coming up on October 12th and I will be there doing three different talks. But um, getting back to this job, I convinced them to send me to PyCon, uh, which was in Montreal that year. And this was this turned out to be a very pivotal, pivotal thing in my career. Not only did I learn a lot of stuff, um, I was able to demonstrate to the, to the company that sent me, you know, look at all these things that I've done for you using Python. This is in your benefit to send me. Uh, and I went and I learned a lot of stuff. But... I also met a fella there by the name of Tom Calloway. He was managing the Fedora booth at the time, and I was wearing my Boston Bruins hat. Now, anyone who knows anything about hockey will know this is something you should not do in Montreal, because Montreal, they really despise Boston, and that spreads out into the fans. Um, so again, I kind of attracted attention by being daring. I'm wearing my Bruins hat. I know that this is a bad move. I'm wearing my Bruins hat in downtown Montreal. Tom happens to have season tickets to the Bruins. He notes my hat and says, hey, you look like a guy I should like sit down and talk to. Do you want to go and find the Bruins game tonight? So uh, just like that, 
I don't know anything about this guy. I didn't know that he was really connected to Red Hat or anything like that. But because I'm wearing my Bruins hat and I'm standing out, we go traipsing around downtown Montreal to a bunch of different bars to try and get them to turn on a Bruins game, which they didn't. Um, so we ended up just like hanging out at the hotel because I had a subscription to the NHL online and we watched the hockey game that way. And during that time, he was just like, well, what are you interested in and all that sort of stuff? And he said, well, you know, you might consider this type of job at Red Hat. And the job that he had in mind was basically the job of a tinkerer, not a code writer, but not just a pure implementer, someone who has to be creative and think on their feet. So what I do for Red Hat is I actually go into a client site and I help them think through different strategies, whether it's security or, you know, how their deployment pipeline kind of flows, or sometimes it's as basic as you guys are talking past each other. And I understand what both sides are saying, and I help them rectify their lines of communication. Um, And there's a lot of freedom and creativity in this role. Uh, I get to go in, I get to play with things that you wouldn't even imagine that people would be doing. And some some of it's crazy, like I'm going to have, you know, 500 containers to do one thing, and some of it is, is genuinely innovative. So I ended up getting my job at Red Hat, not because of Tom, which is what you might think. He just was the one that kind of nudged me in the direction to go apply. He said he would give me a reference, and he did, but no one saw the reference. And that was that was the funny thing. I This job that I had working for this company that does the websites, it got to the point where it was bad. Like for me, it was just terrible. And one morning I just woke up. I said, I waited for my wife to get up and I said, God's telling me today is the day I'm going to quit. And I quit like that. <laughs> and I went. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it, it was, it was bad. Um, And my wife just took it in stride. She's like, okay, I trust you. And uh, so I was out of work for about four months. And during this time, I was like, you know, I should contact Tom and see what's going on and, you know, whatever. And uh, he's he's super busy, super busy guy. Lots of people like him, so it's hard to get his attention. And so, like, the communication would lag days, days at a time between emails or whatever. So I just applied for a job at Red Hat. And, uh... It should be noted that I've, I've also applied at, at Canonical. I went all the way through to the final rounds with Canonical as well, and we decided that probably wasn't the best fit for me. Um, but when I went to Red Hat, I got the recruiter, and the first thing that I said to her was, and I'm, I'm completely serious about this, I will work in your mailroom. I've always wanted to work at Red Hat. This has been a goal of mine, and that, Like, I've been trying to get you guys to talk to me for a long time. And she laughed. And I was like, no, I'm serious. Like, get me in the door somewhere. I will do whatever it is that you want me to do. Right. I will make myself so valuable, you won't be able to shove me back out the door. Exactly. And that's exactly it. And she thought I was joking. And then when I repeated that to the next person, so I passed her screening. And when I repeated it to the technical guy, like, then it started to kind of filter up the chain of... So then I ended up having five interviews because they didn't know what to do with me um, in a good way. So I had to take their their programming test because they weren't sure how, like where, where I was going to fit in. And uh, at the time, I had passed their programming test with the highest that they had seen at that point. That's not to say I'm an all-star programmer. Um, it just means that I have, because I had been doing interviews and stuff like that, I may have been more prepared to do that type of thing sure. by the time that got to me. So I scored really high on the, the programming thing. But then they had me talk to um, like a, an infrastructure architect guy, and he really liked what I had to say. And so now they didn't know what they were going to do with me. So my final interview was they got five heads of departments somehow for an hour in a room and they flew me out to Raleigh and they said, you will give an hour presentation about something you did related to the cloud. And uh, so I had like, there was the head of 
the containers that at the time there was the head of Kubernetes, there was a programming guy, there was, there's a bunch of these guys. And my first comment was like, how did they get all of you guys together in a room? Um, sure. This is, uh, so Steve, if I'm understanding what you're telling me, the, the, the overreaching uh, message here is that what, what Red Hat looks for is not who has the best marks on an application or who can pa pass with the highest test score, any of that. What Red Hat is looking for are people that are genuinely passionate, who, who can provide a genuine um, value to their company. And if, and if you possess those things, they'll find some way to utilize your skill and write you a paycheck to do it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think Red Hat values, Red Hat really does value passion and community and your drive. And they they put a big focus on getting to know the right you and they want to intersect your, your skills and your desires with where the company is. And they feel that that is the best way to provide people a means to make a living, but at the same time, to drive the innovation if they can if they can find that bullseye and put you right in the middle of all of that they know that it's good for you and that in turn is good for red hat um, i did a talk at ohio last year about what it's like to work at red hat um, and i'd be happy with to talk with anybody about that specific topic at, at any time so actually so it's funny you bring that up if, if you're okay with it i kind of want to talk about our exciting project that we're working on Sure, go ahead. Awesome. So one of the things that you you and I have talked about is the fact that um, it would be great to see Red Hat do more community outreach stuff, and specifically you to do a lot of community outreach stuff because you have so much experience in these varied workplaces and varied environments with all of this really cool technology. And so what Steve is going to start doing is he's going to start uh, to put together some tutorials for us here on the Ask Noah Show. And uh, every couple of weeks, every month, every so often, whatever schedule him and I land on, um, we're going to air those tutorials. And so one of the things that's always been my passion is helping people get started with technology, helping people get into technology. And uh, if you're if, if those of you that follow me back back in the last days, you'll remember I used to do a similar kind of thing. I would I when I would find a piece of technology I was excited about, I would do a tutorial. Now, these days, I just don't have the time between prepping for the Ask Noah show and helping with all these other projects that I'm involved in and running a, a company. I just don't have a lot of spare time. And Steve is doing this literally as his day job. So when a new technology like uh, Kubernetes comes out and you want to know what is what what are Kubernetes and how do they work and how do we set them up and what can you do with them? There is somebody like Steve, who is, by the way, more than qualified to talk about Kubernetes, as I'm sure he'll talk about in a second. He can go through and give you a short elevator pitch that we can air in the show. And then either if the tutorial fits, we'll put it in the show or we'll publish it outside the show and we'll have a link and reference to you so you can go back and dig in and find more information. Is that, did I kinda, did, is that, a, is that a good elevator pitch, Steve? I just kind of winged that. Yeah, sounds pretty good to me. So uh, just on Kubernetes, for example, just because I brought it up because it comes up on in, in listener email, it comes up in the contact form. Uh, you have some experience with Kubernetes. Yeah, I do. So my job since I've been at Red Hat has been to work with OpenShift, which is Red Hat's platform for Kubernetes. So it's basically Kubernetes with a lot of enterprise features that we built around it that maybe didn't exist at the time or didn't meet the needs of corporations. So that's what I do almost every day, working with Kubernetes and, and containers and things of that nature. I love it. Steve Ovens, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, his, uh, follow him on Twitter, at Linux Ovens. We'll have a link, of course, to, to his Twitter in the show notes, as well as everything that Steve has talked about. All of that will be linked to podcast.asknoahshow.com. Anything else you want to add before we let you go, Steve? Just that uh, I promise not to spam you on Twitter. Um, I really detest people that, you know, make 700 posts a day. So I, I post like once a week or something like that. And it's not personal. It's usually all technical. You won't get my political views on anything or anything like that. It's to help with announcements and to make amplification of signals. I love that. That's fantastic. Steve Evans, thanks so much for joining us on the program. We'll get you back on the program real soon. 
Thanks, Noah. I appreciate it. 1-855-450-NOAH, 855-450-6624. You can email us live at asknoahshow.com. Make your voice heard. Become a part of the program. If you're not in our Telegram group, you need to be. Telegram.asknoahshow.com. I think we're getting to the point where we're a little overdue for a drawing of sorts. We're going to have to give something away. Something good is going to happen here in the in the next little bit because we just haven't done anything fun in a while. So details on that to follow. But this week, we had an interesting discussion in the Telegram group. I am part of a number of different um, groups. They're not related to the Ask Noah show per se, but of course, any place I am, it's it's show prep material. And one of the one of the um, home lab groups that I am in, there was a discussion this week about a service that Amazon is offering called Amazon Next Generation, and uh, this service is an installation service where they where a contractor builds your house or builds a house, I should say, and they contract then with Amazon to put Alexa and smoke detectors and Wi-Fi and all of this stuff that is all tied to the Amazon Cloudosphere. And then you schedule a time with your Amazon consultant, and this Amazon consultant comes out and turns your smart home on for you. And there was a gentleman that purchased a home with this Amazon next generation installed. And he noticed that there is a technical guy is obviously he's in a group that we talk about home networks and stuff like that. And he finds this very expensive, like $1,200 ruckus access point. He says, what is this thing? And who would leave this in a house? Why is this here? Does a little bit of digging and comes across this, this service that exists from Amazon that quite frankly, you can barely find anything out. And unless you really, really dig, um, Calls the service up, calls Amazon Next Generation up and says, hey, I have this uh, access point that's in my house and I want to use it because it's like a $1,200 access point. And they tell him, you can't activate the access point. You actually have to go through us and we're going to we're going to come out and do this. And so he has been he has been explaining and documenting this entire procedure of getting this home that he purchased with all of this technology built in that he can't use because he needs a consultant from Amazon to come out and activate the stupid thing for him. So we've been having a lively discussion about what do you think? Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it's, do you think it's okay to have companies that are building technology into your house that you can't use without their blessing? Does that seem like a good idea to you? So you too can be part of that discussion. Telegram.asknoahshow.com. Also, another thing I wanted to mention is our logo competition. We are rapidly winding down our logo competition. Uh, we've gotten some t- fantastic submissions. Um, we are having a board meeting where we're going to, uh, all of the uh, Ultra Speed team is we're going to come, come in and sit down. And if they're remote, they'll obviously be sent copies. And we're going to look through all of the top designs. And then from the top designs, it will eventually go to our graphics and promotion team and, and social media guys, and they will pick their top favorites. And then it will ultimately come to me and I, I get the final say because <laughs> my name's on the door. But uh, if you have an interest in submitting a logo, we are refreshing our logo at Altispeed's Technologies. We've gotten to a point where we said it's we're coming up on 10 years. And so we want to start the next year out with a bang. Um, We previously said the deadline was going to be in November, but we may move that back as we have gotten wonderful, amazing submissions. I, I absolutely confident we would come out with a fantastic logo if we stop now, but if there's somebody out there that wants to give it a shot, email us logo at ultaspeed.com. Send in your design. You can just send a JPEG or something like that. Just enough that we can look at it and decide if it's something that we think would fit us well. And we will, of course, get in contact with you and say, hey, uh, this is really great, but we need to make this change or that change. Um, All of the details can be found in a previous Ask No episode where we kind of outline the competition a little bit more thoroughly. We'll, We'll link to that episode in this episode's show notes. And so if you want, again, the show notes, if you, if you're not reading the show notes, if you're not going to podcast.asknoahshow.com, you're only getting about half the show because like this week, there's one, two, three articles that we didn't even get to or four articles that we didn't even get to because we just don't have time. And, uh, and we have so many interesting things to talk about with people like Steve Ovens and uh, our next guest, Dalton Durst from the Ubi Ports Project. That's right. Basically, there's a group of people that came out and said, hey, you know what, Canonical? We don't care that you want to kill off Ubuntu Touch. We don't care that you don't think that Linux belongs on the phone anymore. We're going to continue and pick up that battle. Now, I'll be perfectly honest. This is not necessarily my cup of tea, but there's somebody out there doing it. And so we want to highlight it. So Dalton Durst, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah. Thanks for having me. Hey, I appreciate you being here. So 
for those that don't know, I guess start with the, uh, give me the 30 second elevator pitch as it were. What is UbiPorts? So UbiPorts is a foundation and a community that creates Ubuntu Touch, uh, the mobile operating system that is focused on privacy and security. Awesome. As Canonical began to wind down Ubuntu Touch, you guys decided, hey, there's something really cool here. There's some cool technology that is happening here, and we think that this should continue. There is a user base for this. We want to continue it. And so you've continued to develop it and 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 carry the baton forward despite Canonical sort of pulling the plug. Is, is that kind of right? Yep, that's exactly it. Uh, after Canonical made its huge announcement on April 3rd, we wanted it to be an April Fool's joke so badly. Marius uh, basically took up the torch and said, we're going to do this, and the rest of us were a little upset at first, but then we realized, yes, this is the way that we need to go forward. So you took that disappointment and turned that into passion. Yes. That's uh, that's outstanding. I love that. So talk to me about who the target user of Ubuntu Touch, the target user of UbiPorts, who is the kind of person that wants to install this alternative ROM and run this alternative operating system on their mobile platform. So we find a lot of people who are very interested in privacy and having a choice over who can use their data. Because as you've said on this program a lot, it's very important to give users the choice, not necessarily completely stop all data collection, but to give users the informed decision. So people who are very interested in making that choice, people who are interested in having a Linux-based operating system that isn't Android and actually allows you to do some things that Android won't allow you to do on your phone, uh, such as using a terminal with complete uh, Ubuntu commands available. How has it been getting developers on board and getting people to actually write software for your platform? Because one of the issues I think that a lot of, that keeps a lot of people out of the mobile development space, as particularly as it relates to operating systems, is that if you don't have a robust app ecosystem, it drives users away. And so you have to have users that are being very intentional about their choices, very intentional about their decision to focus on privacy over convenience. Um, But to a certain degree, you have to have a certain amount of apps to make the platform useful at all. And how has that been to get developers on board, to get people involved and to build out that app ecosystem? The app ecosystem is very important to a mobile operating system. In many cases, people say that's the only part that matters. We're very lucky in that Canonical did a lot of the work to get app developers on board, and we basically inherited a lot of them from the Canonical community. So they were developing these apps already, and uh, and you just and you just picked it up and said, well, the project's going to continue. So if you don't want all your hard work to go to waste, you can continue to to bring those apps to life on this platform. Has it being a Linux operating system, basically Linux for the phone, has that allowed you to kind of subvert that in a certain way? So for example, Telegram already exists for the Ubuntu desktop. Do you have to rewrite everything for the mobile platform or can you basically do some kind of UI work to tweak native Linux apps to run on a mobile infrastructure? There is a project available. It's called Libertine and it is part of Ubuntu Touch OTA 4 that we just released that you can use to install desktop apps on your phone. However, most of the time you'll get a better experience if the app has been developed specifically for Ubuntu Touch with our toolkit. Sure. And that, and honestly, uh, don't, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I've said this numerous times. I don't think that desktop applications and desktop interfaces and desktop designs translate well to a four inch screen, nor do I think that things that are, work well in a four inch screen translate to a 27 inch display where you have a keyboard and mouse. Like those are two entirely different computing infrastructures and, and, and t- two entirely different interfaces are going to work a lot better. Um, but I can see a huge drive for the mobile businessmen, for the mobile system admin, for the guy who that you know really really likes Linux. Um, I can see them saying, "I just want to be able to run, you know, like he's like maybe a native terminal app or maybe Sublime Text or or you know any of these apps just because you can, just because it's fun to be able to say." I can run these Linux apps on a tiny little phone. Yep, and we totally see that use case in our community. Uh, We have one person who wrote scripts. I believe he's using Object Pascal, and he writes Docker management tools and other DevOps tools for his phone. And they aren't with the Ubuntu toolkit, but they do look like a lot of fun to write and use. How has this taken off with developers? One of the markets that I could see uh, UbiPorts doing very, very well with is 
the developer market, the people who who like to bang on code and hack on things and they they want complete and total control over their device. Maybe it's not even a privacy thing. Maybe it's just a control thing. Um, Have you seen an uptick in developers saying, I think uh, I think Ubuntu Touch might be a really cool place for me to be as uh, as a as a mobile app developer. So we don't have a lot of data on exactly who is using Ubuntu Touch. One of our uh, catchphrases is we don't know who you are and we want to keep it that way. But we do see a lot of people who uh, come into the community and say, hey, I'm a developer. How can I help? Or I'm a developer. I made this app. What do you think? So we see a lot of those type of people coming in, helping out and using Ubuntu Touch in the meantime. That's very cool. One of the things that prompted this very interview was I kept hearing from a number of community members. Our entire production team was, you know, very big on on getting you on the program and said, you know, you've really got to talk to this guy. It's really great. And 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 the big event, as it were, that kind of inspired all of that was the over the air update. Uh, the the I think it's version four that has come out, or the fourth update, maybe is 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 a better way of saying it. Tell me what's new with OTA four. Yes, we just shipped OTA four yesterday. Uh, OTA. 4- Four is the first release of Ubuntu Touch based on Ubuntu 16.04. So previously we were using Ubuntu 15.04, which was very out of support by now. So now we're getting fixes from the canonical security team, as well as just being on that supported release of Ubuntu. It's really good for us. Why 16.04 and not all the way to the latest LTS 18.04? Ubuntu 16.04 had a lot of nice things that we wanted to keep. It still had a bunch of the packages that are required for Ubuntu Touch. Uh, They hadn't quite been removed by the time that Canonical decided that it was time to drop the project. And it also doesn't require systemd. Ubuntu Touch is currently running Upstart as its init system, which is an alternative to systemd. And it was what Ubuntu was using before the whole systemd craze started. And a lot of the work has been done to port to systemd and all the packages that are missing from Ubuntu. But it's better for us to not finish all that work now. Uh, to be able to have an update that comes out before, you know, 2020. One of the structural things of Ubuntu is that they continue to release the security and 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 serious updates, as it were, for the LTS for five years. And so even on 16.04, their design decision and update decision and security practices are fundamentally what's allowing you to do that then. Yep, that's completely correct. Outstanding. What kind of devices can I expect uh, support on if I was interested in playing with the uh, Ubi port? If I wanted to run Ubuntu Touch, um, can I load it on any phone known to man? Is there a specific list of phones? Do I have to buy a specific phone? So due to the way that Android drivers work, most of them aren't actually committed into the Linux kernel, and they're not open source, so the community isn't able to continue making those into new kernels. So we have to use both the Android kernel and the Android drivers that came with the phone. So we do have a list of supported devices, and you can find it at devices.ubuntu-touch.io. Uh, On that list includes the Nexus 5, the Fairphone 2, and the OnePlus One. Dalton Durst, Ubuntu-Touch.io, UbiPorts.com, at UbiPorts on Twitter, Telegram, Matrix, and on Mastodon. Dalton, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thanks for having me out again. We appreciate it, man. We'll get you back on the program real soon. Again, that was Dalton Durst. Uh, phone lines are open, 1-855-450-NO. It's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Make your voice heard. Become a part of the program. Just a couple minutes left in the hour. Um, this guy, I just want to bring a little bit of attention. Don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but uh, unify-led.ubnt.com. It is a network-managed LED panel with a dimmer switch. That's right. The fine folks at Ubiquity, products who we absolutely love and with just a couple of exceptions, use their products exclusively, have developed a drop-in LED light panel. Now, this light panel will replace a standard ceiling tile. Now, here's the great thing. This is the very cool thing. It's powered PoE. That's right. You heard that right. The light panel, which offers a 100-watt light panel that drops into your false ceiling, is powered over Ethernet. So it is a network light that is powered over Ethernet. You run your network cable, low voltage network cable into the ceiling. It doesn't require an electrician. Replace ceiling tiles wherever you want with these network managed LED dimmer panels. And then from the Unify Control software, you can program network based dimmers to work. Now, this is not a cloud product. As Unify has done numerous times before and continues to do, they offer local network on the LAN based devices, things that anybody can use and don't require any sort of cloud or they certainly don't require an Amazon representative to come to your house and activate the stupid thing. 
I think PoE lights are absolutely going to be the way of the future. If you have ever had to deal in a large office environment or a warehouse where you just need to get some lights going, you know how expensive it is to get an electrician out there. Not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just wanted to bring your attention to it. More information in the in the show notes. Hey guys, did you know this episode is available as a downloadable podcast? That's right. To subscribe to the feed or download the latest episode, visit podcast.asknoahshow.com. There you'll find not only the latest episodes, but all of the articles and ref- material referenced in this episode. You can get the latest of force by uh, following us on Twitter, at Ask Noah Show. The Ask Noah Show continues next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. Huge thanks to Vox Telesis for providing our phone systems. Better producer Sarah R. Carlos Carino. This hour of the show may be over, but there's plenty more content for you 24-7 at asknoahshow.com. Thank you.